looks like um, everyone's here or coming online. Um, just, just so everybody knows, we also will be recording this webinar, so it can be watched later on. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Eric Andelin. I'm the Senior Workflow Specialist with SimActive. And I want to talk today uh, with my guest about streamlining our photogrammetric workflows with scripting and command line processing. So what we'll learn in this webinar is designing simple scripts in the graphical user interface, also via command line, executing scripts within the, the graphical user interface and via the command line, batch processing via scripts, editing output data, because there'll always be human interaction at some point, and saving scripts for reuse, um, which is a real time saver. So with that, I'd like to introduce Aaron with Cornerstone Mapping. Aaron, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Eric, for having me on today. Yep. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I started my company almost 20 years ago, uh, 2002. I started with one airplane, and I've grown the company to now I have multiple airplanes, multiple sensors, large format, uh, hyperspectral, thermal, LiDAR. And what I've gotten into is I, just, I realized that in order to keep up with the data workflow, I needed to have a very efficient data processing methodology. And that's kind of how I fell into SimActive five or six years ago. Yeah, so, I mean, I know that, you know, you're, you're trying to maximize the use of your equipment. Obviously, being a pilot, you've got to be in the air a lot. Yet you also have, you know, among only not only you, but the other people that are working with you, um, you've got, uh, you know, a, a large pile of data that you've captured that you need to come down and process. But then again, you also have to turn around and be available to fly the next day when the weather's good. So um, this scripting process is is something that that helps speed that up for you. And you know, I think that. Uh, you know, it's a great way to maximize uh, your your time and get things done. I, having you know been in the backseat of an aircraft, understanding the the limitations and the weather and all that. You're you're up north in Nebraska. You could talk more about that. You fly everywhere, but you still have limited windows of of when you can get things done, right? Exactly, because if if it's sunny, like today's a beautiful sunny day, you could be out flying, and then you come back and you might have. A, a terabyte of data that you need to download and process, get that converted into your TIFF format. Mm -hmm. And once that's ready, then I want to be able to hit script to go in the morning, say at seven o'clock in the morning, I'm going to go fly for six or eight hours when I come back. Yeah. That data now is ready for the next step. Yeah, um, and it it's, also uh, goes the way around. Maybe it's ready to go. And then before you go to bed or leave the office, you tell it to run again. Or, and sometimes it, it'll run overnight and it'll be ready the next morning. Yeah, yeah and, so and being in the aerial photography business, I know that you have, you know, you're limited. You fly when the weather's good. It doesn't matter what day it is. It doesn't matter if it's the weekend, and, and that's the challenge in, in that profession. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it's the, the, the sim active, the, the scripting makes that uh, a, a very valuable uh, time saver. Before we get into the scripting, let's talk about some basics of photogrammetry. Correlator 3D is a photogrammetry tool, and there are steps that you would take or an optimal workflow to get to your deliverables, and they're listed here. Um, you may not go through all of them, but you're going to go through most of them to create your deliverable. For example, you'll always do tie point extraction. You may or may not need GCPs, and you may not may or may not need to measure them. Um, we'll have a bundle adjustment. You will go through that. Um, from there, you'll create a DSM and or a DTM. And from those products, you might do some editing, the DEM editing tool. Um, from there, we go to ortho rectification. And from the orthos, we create the mosaics. And then ultimately, we may do some mosaic editing. But um, what we've described is your photogrammetric workflow. And all of these steps can be scripted. In fact, I'm going to turn over um, the, the presentation. I'll, I'll share screens with Aaron so he can show you on his end. He's got a workstation set up with some examples. But we'll start with 
um, what it looks like in the user interface, and then we'll move into the command line side of things. So Aaron, if you've got um, Correlator 3D open, um, you can describe it, but what people will see is from left to right, all of the steps described in the slide here, and then he'll also show the automation side of that. So um, Aaron, go ahead, take it over. Thank you, Eric. And uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, open up a 3D correlator and show you how the, uh, the workflow works from the very beginning as if you're doing a project manually, stepwise. And so the splash screen, when you open it up, will offer you to uh, use a UAV or medium format, large format camera, satellite, push screen scanners. So you would pick the option for whatever the imagery you need. So today we're working with a large format camera. Uh, so I fly Ultracam Eagle, which is a large format uh, four band mapping camera. And, and so as we go through this process, you, you decide how many images or cameras that you have. Uh, some of these features are really made for like a drone camera or maybe a multiple individual images for red, green, blue, and infrared, in which case then you pick the unregistered bands and software will automatically do that band uh, stacking for you. Uh, but for us, we just have one camera today. And then I'm going to add the, the folder where all my images are located. And that is going to be in my TIFF files. And uh, depending on the imagery, uh, when we're working with a large format camera, uh, those images typically do not have what they call XF data, uh, whereas a drone image would have that, which is header information, uh, XYZ. Uh, timestamps and those sorts of things. So we use a external uh, orientation file or exterior orientation. And so we'll go find this and here's my file that we have. So it's our, this is already formatted in the semantic format. So it automatically loaded and recognized the image name, east and northing and all the parameters that we need. And then here's where you select your uh, coordinate system. Uh, one method is to go through and manually pick what coordinate system you want to use, UTM or state plane, whatever the case may be. And you can work your way through and select the units in the zone. Or the other option is you can use what's called a EPSG code, in which case then you just type it in uh, for what your area is. For me, it's 26914, and then so you'll see that this information here is exactly the same one I, as I manually picked up here. Yeah, and I'd just, and, like, uh, I, I'd just like to add to that farther on down um, when we start scripting, if you know the EPSG code, it's going to be a lot easier to work with that than to type in all the information above in the common systems interface. Absolutely. So uh, and I thanks for bringing that up, Eric, because we will see this number again. I'll, I'll show you where it is in the script, and it's really easy. And especially if you work through it manually, your first project, you can get all this information. You don't have to go and look it up somewhere else. Right. All right. So now the, uh, the software shows all the images that are brought in, shows me the dimensions of the, the array, the map projection, and you can either continue to add more data or we can continue on. So uh, adding more data might be if you had multiple flying days and you're combining them all into one project, you can go now grab those other folders and add them together. And so now we need to import the uh, uh, camera model. You, you can identify some of this information is coming directly off of the imagery, but it doesn't know the focal length or my principal point offset. And this would usually come off your camera calibration file, uh, like a camera calibration report. So you go look that up. For, for me, I already have one created. And so I'm going to go and I use this camdef file. And so now you'll see that th those parameters are automatically loaded. And that camera definition file, I'll show you, we can look at how to create that for you later. And it's a really simple text file and it's just a couple of button clicks. And this will also be used for scripting. Then we, we choose where we want the uh, project to go. Uh, I'm just going to let it go in there. It's asking me for, the, it's confirming what the map projection is that I set up. 
We do not have an existing DEM. We're going to let the software create the elevation model. And today we're not using ground control data, so we'll leave that off. And also ortho reference or reference orthos, we can bring those in. So if you already have an existing data set and you want to ortho rectify this current new data set to that, you can bring in those orthos if you like. So by default, the uh, satellite imagery uh, will turn on. And we have these online layers that we can turn on and off. Uh, they, they can be useful for identifying or, or confirming that your information is correct, what, where you're working, all that kind of stuff. And then we have the 3D window here so that we can look at the elevation of the information. And this is really kind of neat when we start looking at the elevation data after the DSM is created. And so for now, I'm just going to turn that off. And we, we can turn on and off all these windows. And then if we start uh, with the workflow, it's really easy. You start at the upper left-hand side. You just work left to right. And that will give you your general workflow of uh, importing your data, doing your aerial triangulation, doing your elevation models, and, and ultimately to your orthos and your mosaics and then their uh, volume calculations and those sorts of things. And what's really kind of slick is if you if you know you just want a really quick project and, and take a look at it, there's this easy button. And what it will do is there's some profiles in here that you can pick that will just automatically kind of set up a, a rough standard of what you'd like to start with for your project. And, and so you just go through here, pick these different options. And this is also where you can use it once you get this set up. Instead of running the project, you can also come down and click on this uh, generate script button. This will create the rough outline of a script that you can work from, and you don't have to start from scratch. So yeah, that's when you hit that, like. hang on, when you hit that process button, it generates the script. If you did not check the script button at the bottom, it would actually proceed with the processing. That, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so um, this is really great because it gives you a really nice starting point. It, it populates your the file paths of where everything that you selected earlier. And then if you want to add or change your options, you just do it here, save this text file, and then uh, use it later for your scripting. And so now if you were not going to use, oh, yeah, go ahead, Eric. I was gonna say, so let's go ahead and <clears throat> Also talk about how you would script if you move to the command line side of things. Oh, sure. Yeah. So uh, once we have that, I'm going to go ahead and minimize this. And to show you, uh, if you go into the uh, correlator 3D directory, uh, there are a uh, sample file so you can take a look at. And this is really just like because it has every single operation that you can do. Yeah, just, to, re just this, to reiterate, this sample file comes with Correlator, Correlator 3D. So anybody, everybody has access to this already. And like you said, it gives you all the commands that are possible. And from here, you can edit and create any script you would like to create. That's right. And, and so you can see there's a lot more information here than there was in that sample script that we generated in the, in the GUI. And so, and you don't need all of this information. You only need the, the certain lines that are important to what you want to run. And then if there's something that you don't want to use, you can use this hashtag and that will disable that command and therefore it'll be skipped during the script process. And this is useful for if, you, if you're uh, doing trial and error of different parameters or different outputs, you can test it. Um, but from here, you can just copy and paste any of these commands into your script and it's going to be in the correct format, and it really uh, makes it much easier to use. And so then if you wanted to run a script uh, manually, if you just wanted to have one script you wanted to run, you could come up here and go File, Run Script, and then it's going to say, hey, we need to close your project, and then you would go find that SPT file, and then it would just automatically start running for you. And then when it's done, uh, the the uh, processing window closes, and then your data will be ready for you to use. Now you had a sample the, script, correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so uh, we will show you uh, how to do the batch scripting, which is kind of a more, it's a daisy chain scripting. We'll show you how to do that. That's, for me, that's where the real power is, is for my type of projects. And, and we'll take a look at how that works and why it works well. Uh, but one of the things you do that as you work through here, you use your uh, run your AT. And this is where you'd also do your uh, ground control point selection. After you do that, you would create your uh, digital surface model. And then that goes into extracting a DTM so you can remove all your trees and buildings and above ground features. You usually don't want to use those for your orthophoto production unless you're making uh, true orthophotos. You can then go in and manually add it and clean up your uh, DSM, DTMs, and you work your way through, do orthorectification, mosaicing, and then if you need to move some, edit some scene lines to work around a building or, or avoid some sun glint on water, whatever the case may be, you can use that in the uh, mosaic tool. And that's a really slick tool where you can do live updates, you move the scene line, and it instantly shows you what the new mosaic will look like. And, and then there's some other uh, data processing features, uh, 3D models. You can create a 3D point cloud from the uh, elevation data. Uh, so it's kind of like a uh, LiDAR 3D point cloud, except where it's photogram photogrammetrically uh, generated. Yeah. And, and then you, you can also extract uh, features. So if you're uh, needing your building footprints, you can extract that from the imagery as well. And, and that all comes from your uh, digital surface model. So what we're going to take a look at today is this project that I have flown. And here we have one day of flying. And here we have a bit, each area is about 20 to 30 miles across. And they are grouped together in the path in which I flew them. And this allows the software to uh, keep the project smaller and cluster them. And what this what we do then is we have six of these clusters, and each one's going to run as its own batch process. And so uh, we have six files set up, or six clusters. We can start the process once, and it's going to run through all of them until they're done. Now, before you do that, I just want to point out, um, you know, Correlator 3D, it works for everything from satellite on down to um, drones. So. You know, full format cameras down to 20 megapixel cameras and where this would apply for, you know, that drone operator is if they're doing volumes consistently of a cluster of uh, areas, you know, say in the course of a day, um, you know, you may capture 15 uh, stockpiles in a day. Well, you could turn around and use this batch method um, to cluster these together as you said, daisy chain them and then process them all at once, you know, say overnight. So that's that's a really nice feature for folks that are doing not only large areas, but also small areas. It just depends on, uh, you know, where they're at and how they're clustered. Right. And, and something to go along with that is if you're flying maybe the same stockpile week after week. Yeah. Every Monday, you go out and fly. Well, you already have a script ready. All you have to do is move your data into the correct directory structure and tell it to run. And everything's going to go just as you had set it up before. And that's which a huge time. Yeah, which also applies to even someone who is not doing a clustered area, but is doing, say, consistent site monitoring of a project. Once right. they do it once, they can generate a script for that. And then the next time, all they have to do is put the imagery in that directory, directory and rerun it. So that's a big time saver. Yeah. So, um, so what we're going to do now, I'm going to show you this directory structure that I have set up. And so as you can see here, we have uh, images 1 through 10. And, and that's just this first flight line. Uh, in this cluster, there are 51 images. and with the Ultracam Eagle, each image is one gigabyte in size. And so if you have 51 images, now you have 51 gigabytes worth of data just in this one cluster. And so you can imagine that this is really, doesn't really matter how big your files are or how many files. It, the software can handle that really nicely, especially with the uh, Great. processing on the graphics card.
And so what we have here is if you think back to the GUI interface, we have our, our TIFF file directory where all of the images are stored. We have the camera definition file that is stored in here. And we'll open this up to show you. It's a really basic file. It tells you all the information about the camera. And if you have a metric camera, this information doesn't change. If, you're, if you have a uh, medium format camera that's not calibrated or a uh, UAV camera, the Simactive Correlator 3D software will automatically create a camera model and help you remove those distortions to get a high accuracy uh, map product. And then we have uh, the directory structure. So for, for this prop, uh, demo, I just called it day one. You may have a, might want to use a calendar date or Julian date or whatever makes sense for you. And then I created a directory structure and I'm using just the file names that are within each of those clusters. So starting with image one through 51, the next cluster is 52 through 121 and so on until all the clusters are together. And then it, with and each one of these, we really just we're now we're down to just two files that we're starting with. One is the exterior orientation, which is uh, your image name and your X Y Z Omega Phi Kappa. And these within this, this will be the the same number. So 52 through uh, right. 121. So that you only want the images that you're working with to be in this EO file, even though your full day has hundreds of images. And then you have the script file. And you'll notice I have the same naming for each of these, but the file extension is different. And so in here, this is where I set up the, uh, the constraints. I'm, I'm doing constrained AT uh, with a 10 centimeter XYZ and a 0 0.07 degrees on the roll pitch and yaw for the IMU. Now this, these parameters will change depending on the type of project you're using or your processing, and then also the quality of the GPS IME that you're, you have on the aircraft. And, and then I, I just worked through here, and I have set up for aerial triangulation. It's going to run through and do DSM generation, D team extraction, ortho rectification, all the way through creating the mosaic, and then even clipping that mosaic out into individual tiles for the final delivery. All right. And so the, the scripting is set up so that we can go ahead and process everything to the final uh, end product, which is the mosaic, but also tiled out according to a shapefile definition with the uh, image tile names in there. And so that, that really helps us get all the way through to the final product uh, in an automated way. So then what I do is, so since we have this directory structure with all the six different clusters, I, I set up a, uh, a DOS command using bat files, and I'm not a programmer by any means at all. Like, I, I can get by doing DOS scripting. If I don't know how to do something, I usually have to Google on how to do that. Uh, but if you uh, go in here and you edit this, a bat file is really just a text file of uh, DOS commands. And so if you use this for command, and then you tell it where to go do something, which is go look in day one, and then do call this other file called day one running. So if you kind of look down here, I have this start and then I have it running. And so what this is, is uh, the start is saying, hey, let's go ahead and do this. And the running is the instructions for each of those folders. And so if you take a look at what's in here, this is really now telling the computer to say, hey, let's go ahead and open up 3D Correlator. We're going to convert the EO file. Here's where to find it. Here's my map coordinate system. And then it's going to convert into an EO. And then earlier we talked about that EP uh, SG file. And here's the number for that. And so you type that in, and now it automatically knows what coordinate system you want to be working with. The camera definition file, uh, where your imagery is located here. And it just works it through, and then it's going to continue scripting, uh, or cycling, I should say, through each of those directories until the last one's completed. And then the uh, process will terminate. That's a that's, so even, that's that's a good okay. script example for folks, and it does include, like you said, the daisy chaining effect. So, um, if anybody's curious and they really want to dig into that, when the when we put the video out and make it available, make sure you stop there and you take a look at that, and and you can it'll help you figure out how to do the daisy chaining portion. 
Right. And, and this is really slick too, because you can set it up and instead of having to be sitting in front of the GUI and clicking through each of the steps and put doing your quality control. And, and I should say, you really do need to continue to do your quality control. You can't just trust that your input data is good and your output's gonna be exactly what you want. Uh, but in scenarios like this, where uh, maybe the RMS, like your horizontal accuracy per project is two, three, four meters, um, you don't need to deliver uh, the elevation models. You really just, because you don't have ground control, you just need a simple orthophoto mosaic for my workflow and the customers that I'm flying flying are allowing me to process in this fashion and that saves a ton of time because for me I am flying the aircraft and then when I'm not flying I'm in the office processing the data. This allows me now to say you know what I'm going to start this script it's going to run overnight and it'll be ready uh, tomorrow which is exactly what I did with this data set. I, I started it last night when I came in this morning it was ready for me to start working with. Right. Yeah and, and so if you remember we only start off with the two files the, the EO and the script. And now if we go and look in this first folder, now we have all these different directories. And the directories are all based on what you have in the script. Uh, so you have the aerial triangulation, you have the elevation model, uh, you have the orthos, you have the mosaic, and even the exported TIFF files, that will be the final deliverable. So to be clear, when you created the script, you told it to create those folders, basically. Yes. Yep. Yeah, so when we, if you were to open up, and then also as part of this, you can go in and say, hey, let's go take a look at the uh, quality control. And let's assess how good does that data look. And I intentionally uh, did use a little bit tighter uh, IMU value to, to show that all the data is not perfect in, in the sense of maybe or the altitude that you're flying or the resolution that you're after, it may not be great. And so if you look here, we have lots of, uh, greens and yellows and reds. And so you you take a look at that and be like, you know what, we need to tweak those values. Uh, they're a little bit too tight. Let's loosen the standard deviation maybe for the the positioning or for the IMU, the roll pitch and yaw. And, and so those are things that you can do. You can evaluate, tweak it, and make sure everything is uh, working the way it should. So the rest of the quality report is telling you about uh, what how much the adjustments were, all those kinds of uh, parameters that you can look at. But so now what we can do then, come back to 3D Correlator, uh, you can load in all this information, all that data that was created from the script. And so now here is an example of the uh, output mosaic. And what it's doing is it's reading in all this data, and then when, once it's in, and then it'll be pretty quick. Uh, so I'm going to turn off the mosaic, and then we'll be showing the uh, elevation model that the software automatically created. And this area is located up in the sand hills of Nebraska, so there's a lot of hilliness, uh, not much for uh, buildings or roads or anything like this. Uh, so what we're looking at is surface model and all these little bumps and ridges that you're seeing are the trees. And the purpose of this project was to map the cedar trees, which are invasive in this area. And so what you can see here, like, well, we don't want the trees and the elevation model for the ortho processing. So the software automatically created the uh, digital terrain model. And when that loads, you'll see that all the trees have now been removed from the elevation model for the ortho photo processing. And then one of the tools you can do is if you want to further take a look at it, there's a, a really slick uh, profile tool. And we can click and do this, now we can take a look at what, what does that elevation look like as we move the cursor along, you'll see it move on your uh, profile and you can see what the actual elevation is along the way. So that could be a really handy tool. Especially when you're looking to make sure that, you know, the, the algorithm did eliminate, say, trees or if you're in an urban environment, eliminate buildings and things like that. Um, it's a good way sure. to kind of QC that. Right, or if you're doing a stockpile inventory, so you can take a look, you can evaluate the shape of the profile yep. of the, the sand pile or coal pile or whatever the case may be. Right. Yeah. And, and so now what we're gonna do is we'll, we'll turn on the, uh, the mosaic. And this is also kind of neat too. Now we look at this, and this is flown in leaf off, meaning uh, no leaves on the trees. 
and the grasses are going to be dormant, so they're brown. The, the imagery doesn't look very attractive. Um, but what we can do now is we can change the color channels. And so instead of being a color image, we can make it a color infrared image. And what that will allow us to do now is all, anything that has a lot of biomass is going to pop in a red color. Now let's let's uh, let me qualify here that you're using a camera that does have that capability. So this is not this is not trickery of of software or anything like that. But the actual filter cam that you use um, has that additional band. That, that's right. So it's a four band camera that has the red, green, and blue, which makes your color image. Then what's called near infrared, which is a, uh, a really good indicator for biomass right. detection. And so, like, and that's a good point because a lot, uh, a lot of drone cameras are really just a color camera, red, green, and blue. Yep. Uh, and so, depending on the type of camera that you have, uh, or some drone cameras have four, five, six bands. Uh, 3D correlator can handle however many bands there are in that data set. And so, the per so as you can see now, we can look around and we can see that most of the grasses are dormant, uh, but the individual trees now they can count even the smallest of trees. They, they can count and see where those are and do some documentation and identify uh, where those are. And then you can also use this 3D inlay yeah. to rotate, look at the elevation, and whatever other features you're looking at. And then, uh, so, even, so this mosaic now is the entire flight line, but it's not really practical to deliver a file this big because this image of a uh, flight line of 10 images is going to be over 10 gigabytes worth of data. And so what I do is I, I tile that using a shape file. And so now the actual deliverable is going to be these individual tiles. And that, those will be exported in the GeoTIFF format in the um, Mosaic export folder that I defined. So here with the, with the tiling, um, you probably know what or you design the tile scheme outside of, say, Corollary 3D, you can design a tile scheme because, again, you have multiple projects within this scene. Um, it's easier to design that tile scheme outside and say, QGIS or something like that, convert it to a shape file, and then import it into Corollary 3D, where in during your processing on the export side of the mosaic, it automatically tiles it um, to those tiles. That's right. And so if we were, we could also go to share that point is we can export the mosaic manually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we would pick an export file and you can either do it from a file, which is what I did with the shape file, or you can do automatic tiling and then you can call it uh, whatever you want to call it. Let's say cedars. And then we want to do it at a fixed tile size of, uh, maybe 1,000 by 1,000. And then it would automatically uh, tile the imagery for you and number it. Right. And, and then another kind of a neat thing too, it's like, well, we don't want maybe a, a standard export. Maybe we want to do a, uh, like an NDVI or something. And so now we can change that. This is great for agricultural applications. And, and this can also be added to your scripting. So you can do an export of the four band image but also at the same time do the NDVI all in one process. Right. And, and then you can also change your uh, the file format if maybe you just want a, a TIFF, a GeoTIFF, I should say a TIFF of the world file, you can pick that option. Uh, if you want to do some image compression, uh, that can be handy too, because some, sometimes these files get really, really large and doing a compression on your TIFF files can be helpful. And so that, that's how I automate it. So then, so right now we go into this uh, folder and we can take a look and, and see that all of the image mosaics are now out, processed out and they have a file definition that I already had inside of the shape file. Right, and as you say, that, that becomes very handy when you're delivering uh, data sets that, that you know, are fairly large because you, you have to remember that the engineer or the GISP who is working with this on the other end 
you know, they may not have that, that powerful processing workstation that you have. Well, that's correct. And the nice part is too, then it will also just automatically load into whatever GIS software that they're using. Right. And so that, that's a really nice uh, feature as well because those industry standards and then, so everything that comes out of here, uh, if you want to export your uh, 3D point cloud, you can export that into a last file. And, and likewise, you can import a last file and use that as your elevation for your data processing if you want. Right. So in this case, so I, in this case, you had uh, a cluster of of uh, lights in there that that you put together and you and you set up and then in the original slide you showed even more clusters so typically you would just daisy chain those all correct that's right and so that it's exactly how that script is set up is that after this one was processed it moved on to the second one on to the third one the fourth one fifth one and the sixth one and so all that information i just showed you within 3d correlator this is now each of those is six different projects and you can start once the first one is done you can start doing quality control bring the, that uh, exported imagery over to your gis software you can start doing your gis assessment of that data meanwhile it's still cranking away on all these other projects for you and, and so that's a nice benefit too because now if you have multiple workstations you can start divvying it up and being more efficient with your own time while you're sitting in the office yeah, especially now that we have the dis distributed processing tools, that's that's really handy. Um, so one thing I'd like to talk about a little bit is, you know, we do all this um, for efficiency and, and maximizing the time uh, that we have while we're on the ground. Uh, but um, as someone comes in as a beginner, um, you want to make sure that you set these projects up right. Um, that you're getting the result that you want before you go ahead and batch these on through through each each area. So, you know, I, I just from your professional opinion, does not does it not make sense, especially if it's in a new area, that you would maybe manually at least walk through one of them, or if you're creating the batch or not the batch, but if you're creating the script, would you would you run the script on one area first, make sure you're getting the results you want um, before you go ahead and start batching them to the others. Oh, absolutely. Because what you don't want to, you want to make sure you're setting things up correctly because if you are using the wrong parameters, you might realize like, oh, this is taking me way too long. I, I, I don't need a 25 centimeter GSD uh, ortho, or not ortho, but a uh, elevation model. Right. Maybe we reduce it to be two, three, or four meters, and that'll speed up your data processing exponentially. And you might find, you know what, that still allows me to deliver the quality of imagery that I need for whatever the project is. And, and so what you don't want to do is you don't want to spend a day or two processing the data only to find out that you should have changed the parameter, and therefore now you have to run it again. <laughs> yeah, that becomes a challenge. The other thing, um that I wanted to talk about here real quick is that, you know, this project, uh, it didn't require any control. Um, so it was, it was relatively easy to set up and run. So when, when folks do have projects where they have control, um, the, what we want to get across, the point I want to get across is, is that you can set these scripts up to go part way. So you can say, you know, uh, do the AT, um, get me to the point where I am now going to open it up, manually measure those control points, save that, then run another script that runs it through the rest of the process. And what, what Aaron is showing right here is he's actually setting that script up right now. Um, so he's, he's turned off all of the features other than the AT portion, and he can generate a script from that, which is right there. Now he can cut and paste that and use that um, again on all of these in a in a daisy chain fashion. At least let them all get to the point where you're measuring the control points when you wake up in the morning, for example. All right, 
And, and so what you might do, just like you said, we'll run the AT first, measure your control points, and then now we create a second script and it says, okay, let's do the elevation model and the ortho rectification. Right. And now that becomes a separate script and then uh, you just stepwise. Yes. Yeah, so you take a break in the middle where you need the human interaction and then you can go ahead and automate the rest of it. Yeah, that's that. And, and that was really well. So it, 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 some of your scripts, like what I showed you earlier, is going to be start to finish for the whole project. Others, uh, where you do, say, if you're doing stockpile volume in, inventories and maybe you need to draw the, the toe of the pile, well, that's a manual process. The software generally doesn't know how to draw those or where to draw them. And then also the ground control. And those, you just manually measure that. Maybe it only takes you five or 10 minutes to do that. And then you tell it to start going again. Yes. So, you know, I, I guess what, what I'd like people to get out of this, especially is, is they get uh, busier and busier and, and, you know, you're a small shop and you've got a lot of work to do. So, you know, when, when you're out flying or when you have someone else out flying for you, you don't have a lot of time on ground before you have to go out and do the next project. That may be a little different in the, in say, for example, the drone world, um, you know, based on how much work you have and how often you're out flying. But the time saver here is, is that, you know, say you fly all day, you come home, you've already got a pre-designed script to process through this data. That's a time saver. The other thing is, is you may still be out in the field. You may be transitioning back to the office, um, yet you can go ahead and design and edit that script um, and have it ready before you get to the office or, you know, run command line um, back into your workstation in the office and, and have it start processing. Yeah, and that's a good point. That's something I, I do fairly often is if I'm on the road doing maybe an overnight project and the computers are they're done running one batch, I can log in and see, oh, it's done, it's ready for the next one. And using the remote control software, uh, whatever kind you want to use, I can go in, you can't necessarily run 3D Correlator remotely, right. uh, the license doesn't work that way, but I can tell the script to start and then it will run locally for me. And it's just a matter of double clicking on that bath pile and it starts going. Uh, and so that, that's a huge time saver because now I know that the data is processing and I'm coming home and it'll be ready when I get back. Yeah, and you know, uh, you know, we're we're a little bit diff different generation um, in that we did have to learn DOS and things like that when we were younger, um, me being in my 50s. Uh, but not that we've gotten away from that and, and granted people are coding in different ways, but a very basic uh, you know, batch file through DOS command can do a lot of work for you. And um, that becomes really handy. And I, I would imagine, Aaron, you could attest to this, but once you get proficient in those, you tend to start things off that way more than you do in the GUI. Oh, absolutely. Because you get a feel for where you need to stop and take a look at your data and analyze it. So like right away, I'll just have, I have a set of different scripts that do just that. You start with and do the first one or two stages, let it run, come back. That allows me to go and do the other parts, running the other parts of the business, run doing emails or quoting or whatever the case may be. And then I can come back over to a different workstation and say, okay, here, here's where I'm at. I'm going to measure my ground control, take the 10 minutes to do that or however long it needs. And then you start the next process and go back and work on, a, on your next proposal. Well, Aaron, if you could turn the screen back over to me, that'd be great. Sure. And I'll share mine. So we talked about um, automating with scripts and the different things you can do with it. And these are some of the slides that, that we skipped over as, as we did that. Um, some script examples. And again, this, this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to see this information uh, later if you don't catch it now. Um, here we went over the, the AOIs. And um, how we can batch projects together, um, some information again on setting up those batch files. And then we went over the uh, sample outputs that Aaron provided. So uh, obviously creating your, your uh, surface models, flattening those out to DTMs, 
uh, looking at it in color IR, so you've got, you know, if you've got that type of camera, you're, you're able to do that, the mosaic creation, all of that. Um, and what we really want to get across is that you can expand the capabilities of Correlator 3D. It's already built in that you can um, run scripts, create batch processes um, to, to create deliverables quickly, Kind of, you know, not not that it's automated because it's not. You're you're setting it up, uh, but it is a real time saver for folks. And Aaron, do you have any other final comments? Uh, no, I, I think. Well, I guess maybe one tip that we uh, talked about a little bit is the scripting itself really isn't hard. But I would always remember to just double check your spelling. Uh, a, a simple transposition of numbers or letters. Can, can make that script stop. And so I think if you remember that, it's like uh, run it. If it doesn't work, just read through it, make sure you identify what the issue is and run it again. And a lot of times that's 90% of the time, that's what the issue is. Uh, so I think just keeping that in mind, uh, the automation of the whole thing is uh, really helpful in my business. Yeah, and with that, I'd like to, to close the webinar. I know we've got some questions, we'll get those answered. Um, but uh, I really want to thank Aaron for, for getting involved here. He is certainly a, a Correlator 3D power user. I hope everybody enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Eric.